Nobody's Boy by Hector Milat, translated by Florence Crew Jones. Chapter 14. The Death of Pretty Heart. The Death of Pretty Heart. The sun came out brightly. Its rays fell on the white snow, and the forest, which the night before had looked so bleak and livid, was now dazzling with a radiancy that blinded the eyes. Several times Vitalis passed his hand under the coverlet to feel pretty heart, but the poor little monkey did not get warmer, and when I bent over him I could hear him shivering and shaking. The blood in his veins was frozen. "'We must get to a village or pretty heart will die,' said Vitalis. "'Let us start at once.' His wrappings were well heated, and the little creature was rolled in them. My master placed him under his vest next his heart. We were ready. "'This was a shelter,' said Vitalis, looking round the hut as we were going out. "'That has made us pay dearly for its hospitality.' His voice trembled. He went out first, and I followed in his footsteps. When we had gone a few yards, we had to call out to Cappy Poor Dog. He had remained standing outside the hut, his nose turned to the spot where his companions had been taken by the wolves. Ten minutes later, we reached the main road. We passed a cart. The driver told us that within an hour we should reach a village. This was encouraging, yet it was difficult, even painful, to walk. The snow came up to my waist. Many times I asked Vitalis after Pretty Heart. Each time he told me that he was still shivering. At last we saw the white roofs of a fair-sized village. We were not in the habit of putting up at the better-class inns. We always chose a poor place, where we were sure we would not be driven away, and where they would not take all we had. But this time Vitalis went into an inn where a beautiful sign hung outside the kitchen door. The door was open and we could see the great stove covering with shiny copper saucepans, from which the steam was rising. Ah, how good that soup smelled to the famished wanderers! My master, putting on his most gentlemanly airs, and with his hat on his head, and his head thrown back, asked the landlady for a good bed and a fire. At first the landlady, who was a fine-looking woman, had not condescended to notice us, but Vitalis's grand manner evidently impressed her. She spoke to a maid and told her to take us up to her room. "'Quick, get into bed,' said Vitalis, while the servant was lighting the fire. I looked at him in astonishment. "'Why go to bed? I would rather sit down and eat something than go to bed.' "'Quick, hurry up,' repeated Vitalis. There was nothing to do but obey. There was an eiderdown quilt on the bed. Vitalis pulled it right up to my chin. Try and get warm, he said. The warmer you are, the better. It seemed to me that Pretty Heart needed warming much more than I, because I was not very cold now. While I laid still under the eiderdown trying to get warm, Vitalis, to the servant's astonishment, turned little Pretty Heart round and round before the fire as though he were going to roast him. "'Are you warm?' Vitalis asked me after a few minutes. "'I'm suffocating.' Well, "'That's right.' He came to the bed quickly. He put Pretty Heart in, telling me to hold him close to my chest. The poor little animal, who always rebelled when he was made to do something that he did not want, seemed resigned to everything. He let me hold him close to my body without making a movement. But he was not cold now. His body was burning. My master, who had gone down to the kitchen, soon returned, carrying a bowl of well-sweetened wine. He tried to make Pretty Heart drink a few spoonfuls, but the poor little creature could not unclench his teeth. With his brilliant eyes, he looked at us imploringly, as though to ask us not to torment him. Then he drew one arm from under the covers and held it out to us. I wondered what he meant. I looked inquiringly at Vitalis, who explained. Before I had met them, Pretty Heart had had an inflammation of the lungs, and they had had to bleed him, taking the blood from his arm. Knowing that he was sick now, he wanted us to bleed him so that he could get better as before. Poor little monkey. Vitalis was touched to the heart, 
and this made him still more anxious. It was evident that Pretty Heart was ill, and he must be very ill indeed to refuse the sugared wine that he liked so much. "'Drink the wine, Remy, and stay in bed,' said Vitalis. "'I'll go for a doctor.' I must admit that I also liked sugar wine, and besides, I was very hungry. I did not let him tell me twice to drink it. After I had emptied the bowl, I slid down under the eider down again, where the heat, aided by the wine, nearly suffocated me. Vitalis was not gone long. He soon returned, bringing with him a gentleman wearing gold-rimmed spectacles, the doctor. Thinking that the doctor might not put himself out for a monkey... Vitalis had told him not who was his patient. When he saw me in bed, as red as a tomato, the doctor put his hand on my forehead and at once said, Congestion. He shook his head with an air which argued nothing good. Anxious to undeceive him for fear he might bleed me, I cried, Why, I'm not ill. Not ill? Why, the child is delirious. I lifted the quilt a bit and showed him pretty hard who had placed his little arm round my neck. "'He's the one that's ill,' I said. "'A monkey!' he exclaimed, turning angrily to Vitalis. "'You've brought me out in such weather to see a monkey?' Our master was a smart man who was not easily ruffled. Politely, and with his grand air, he stopped the doctor. Then he explained the situation, how he had been caught in a snowstorm, and how through fear of the wolves Pretty Heart had jumped into an oak tree, where he had been almost frozen to death. The patient might only be a monkey, but what a genius! And what a friend and companion to us! How could we confide such a wonderful, talented creature to the care of a simple veterinary surgeon? Everyone knew the village veterinary was an ass, while everyone knew that the doctors were scientific men, even in the smallest village. If one rings at a door which bears a doctor's name, one is sure to find a man of knowledge and of generosity. Although the monkey is only an animal, according to naturalists, they are so near like men that often an illness is treated the same as one for the other. And was it not interesting, from a scientific point of view, to study how these illnesses differed? The doctor soon returned from the door where he had been standing. Pretty Heart, who had probably guessed that this person wearing the spectacles was a physician, again pushed out his arm. Look, cried Vitalis, he wants you to bleed him. That settled the doctor. Most interesting, a very interesting case, he murmured. Alas, after examining him, the doctor told us that poor little Pretty Heart had again inflammation of the lungs. The doctor took his arm and thrust a lancet into a vein without him making the slightest moan. Pretty Heart knew that this ought to cure him. After the bleeding, he required a good deal of attention. I, of course, had not stayed in bed. I was the nurse, carrying out Vitalis' instructions. Poor little Pretty Heart. He liked me to nurse him. He looked at me and smiled sadly. His look was quite human. He, who was usually so quick and petulant, always playing tricks on one of us, was now quiet and obedient. In the days that follow, he tried to show us how friendly he felt toward us, even to Cappy, who had so often been the victim of his tricks. As is the usual trend for inflammation of the lungs, he soon began to cough. The attacks tired him greatly, for his little body shook convulsively. All the money which I had, five sous, I spent on sugar sticks for him, but they made him worse instead of better. With his keen instinct, he soon noticed that every time he coughed, I gave him a little piece of sugar stick. He took advantage of this and coughed every moment in order to get the remedy that he liked so much, and this remedy, instead of curing him, made him worse. When I found out this trick, I naturally stopped giving him the candy, but he was not discouraged. First he begged for it with an appealing look. Then, when he saw that I would not give it to him, he sat up in his seat and bent his little body with his hand on his stomach and coughed with all his might. The veins on his forehead stood out and tears ran from his eyes, and his pretense at choking, in the end, 
turned to a dreadful attack over which he had no control. I had to stay at the end with pretty heart while my master went out alone. One morning upon his return, he told me that the landlady had demanded the sum that we owed her. This was the first time that he had ever spoken to me about money. It was quite by chance that I had learned that he had sold his watch to buy my sheepskin. Now he told me that he had only fifty sous left. The only thing to do, he said, was to give a performance that same day. A performance without Serbino, Dulce, or Pretty Heart? Why, that seemed to me impossible. We must get forty francs at once, he said. Pretty Heart must be looked after. We must have a fire in the room, and medicine, and the landlady must be paid. If we pay her what we owe her, she will still give us another credit. Forty francs in this village? In the cold? And which such poor resources at our command? While I stayed at home with Pretty Heart, Vitalis found a hall in the public market, for an out-of-door performance was out of the question. He wrote the announcements and stuck them up all over the village, and bravely spent his last fifty sous to buy some candles, which he cut in half so as to double the lights. From the window of our room I saw him come and go, tramping back and forth in the snow. I wondered anxiously what program he could make. I was soon enlightened on the subject, for along came the town crier of the village, wearing a scarlet cap, and stopped before the inn. After a magnificent roll of his drum, he read out our program. Vitalis had made the most extravagant promises. That there was to present a world-renowned artist, that was Cappy, and a young singer who was a marvel. The marvel was myself. But the most interesting part of the farce was that there was no fixed price for the entertainment. We relied upon the generosity of the audience, and the public need not pay until after it had seen, heard, and applauded. That seemed to me extraordinarily bold. Who was going to applaud us? Cappy certainly deserved to be celebrated, but I... I was not at all convinced that I was a marvel. Although Pretty Heart was very ill at this moment, when he heard the drum, he tried to get up. From the noise and Cappy's barks, he seemed to guess that it was to announce our performance. I had to force him back on this bed. Then he made signs to me to give him his general's uniform, the red coat and trousers with gold braid, and hat with the plume. He clasped his hands and went down on his knees to beg me. When he saw that he could get nothing from me by begging, he tried what anger would do, and then finally melted into tears. It was evident that we should have a great deal of trouble to convince him that he must give up all idea of playing that night. I thought it would be better not to let him know when we started. When Vitalis returned, he told me to get my harp ready and all the things we required for the entertainment. Pretty Heart, who knew what this meant, turned to his master and commenced his entreaties again. He could not have better expressed his desires than by the sounds he uttered, the twisting of his face, and the turns of his body. There were real tears on his cheeks, and they were real kisses that he imprinted on Vitalis's hand. "'You want to play?' asked Vitalis, who had not been told what happened before. Yes, oh yes, Pretty Heart's whole person seemed to cry out. He tried to jump to show that he was no longer sick. We knew very well that if we took him out, it would be his death. It was time for us to start. Before going, I made up a good fire and wrapped Pretty Heart in his coverlets. He cried again and embraced me as much as he could. Then we started. As we tramped through the snow, my master told me what he expected of me. We could not, of course, give our usual repertoire, as our principal actors were missing, but Cappy and I could vie with each other in doing our best. We had to collect forty francs. Forty francs! It was terrible. Impossible. Vitalis had prepared everything. All we had to do now was to light the candles— but this was an extravagance we could not indulge in until the room was filled, for our illuminations would not have to come to an end before our entertainment. Whilst we took possession of our theatre, the town crier, with his drum, 
came through the village streets for the last time. After I addressed Cappy and myself, I went outside and stood behind a pillar to watch the people arrive. The roll of the drum became louder. It was approaching the marketplace, and I could hear a babble of voices. Behind the drum came a score of youngsters, all keeping step. Without stopping the beating of his drum, the town crier took up his place between the two large lamps that were lit at the entrance of our theater. The public had only to walk in and take their seats for the performance to commence. Alas, how long they were coming, yet the drum at the door continued gaily its rat tat tat ta All the boys in the village must have been there. But it was not the youngsters who were likely to give us forty francs. There would have to be some important people, open-handed and generous. At last, Vitalis decided that we ought to commence, although the hall was far from being full. But we could not wait longer, worried as we were by the terrible question of candles. I had to appear first and sing a few songs, accompanying myself on the harp. I must confess the applause I received was very weak. I had never thought very much of myself as an entertainer, but the marked coolness with which the audience received my efforts discouraged me. If I did not please them, they would certainly not give us anything. It was not for the glory that I was singing. It was for poor Pretty Heart. Ah, how I wanted to stir this public to make them enthusiastic, but I could see only too well that they did not consider me a marvel. Cappy was more successful. He received several encores. Thanks to Cappy, the entertainment ended in a burst of applause. Not only did they clap their hands, but they stamped their feet. The decisive moment had arrived. While Cappy, with the cup in his jaws, ran through the audience, I danced a Spanish dance on the stage, with Vitalis playing in accompaniment. Would Cappy collect forty francs? That was the question which made my heart beat while I smiled at the public in my pleasantest manner. I was out of breath, but I still continued to dance, for I was not to stop until Cappy had returned. He did not hurry himself. When he found that he did not receive a coin, he placed his paw against the person's pocket. At last I saw him about to return, and thought I might stop, but Vitalis made the sign to go on. I continued to dance, and going a few steps nearer to Cappy, I saw that the cup was not full, far from it. Vitalis had also seen this. Bowing to the audience, he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I think that, without flattering ourselves, we have conscientiously carried out our program. Yet, as our candles are still burning, I will, if the public wishes, sing some songs myself. Our dog, Cappy, will make another quest, and those who have not yet given will perhaps give this time. Please have your money ready. Although Vitalis had been my teacher, I had never really heard him sing, or at least not as he sung that evening. He selected two songs, an air from Joseph and one from Richard the Lionhearted. Although I was only a little boy and was no judge as to whether one sang with technique or without, Vitalis' singing stirred me strangely. I went into a corner of the stage, for my eyes filled with tears as I listened to his beautiful notes. Through a mist, I saw a young lady, who occupied the first row, clap her hands with all her might. I had already noticed that she was not a peasant like the rest of the people in the hall. She was a lady, young and beautiful and from her handsome fur coat I took her to be the richest woman in the village. She had with her a little child who had applauded Cappy heartily. It was probably her son, for the likeness was striking. After the first song, Cappy went round again. I saw with surprise that the lady had not put anything into his cup. When my master had finished the air from the second opera, she beckoned me to her. I want to speak to that gentleman, she said. I was surprised. I, I thought that she would have done better to have dropped something into the cup. Cappy returned. He had collected very little more on the second round. What does the lady want? asked Vitalis. To speak to you. I have nothing to say. She did not give anything to Cappy. Perhaps she would like to give it now. Then it is for Cappy to go to her, not for me. However, he decided to go and took the dog with him. 
I followed them. By now a servant had appeared, carrying a lantern and a rug. He stood beside the lady and the child. Vitalis bowed coldly to her. "'Forgive me for having disturbed you,' she said. "'But I wanted to congratulate you.' Vitalis bowed, without saying a word. "'I am a musician,' continued the lady. "'I am telling you this so that you will know how much I appreciate your superb talent.' "'Superb talent? My master? The dog trainer? I was amazed. "'An old man like me has no talent,' he replied coldly. "'Do not think I am inquisitive, but,' began the lady. "'I am quite willing to satisfy your curiosity, madam,' he said. "'You are surprised that a dog trainer is able to sing a little. "'But I have not always been what I am now. "'When I was younger I was... "'the servant of a great singer, and like a parrot I imitated him. "'I began to repeat some of the songs he practiced in my presence, and that is all.' "'The lady did not reply. "'She looked hard at Vitalis. "'He seemed embarrassed. "'Goodbye, sir,' she said at last, laying stress on the word sir. "'Goodbye, and once more let me thank you for the exquisite delight you have given me this evening.' and leaning towards Cappy, she dropped a gold piece in his cup. I thought Vitalis would escort her to the door, but he did nothing of the kind. And when she was out of hearing, I heard him swear softly in Italian. She gave Cappy a louis, I said. I thought he was going to give me a blow, but he let his raised hand fall to his side. A louis, he said, as though he were coming out of a dream. Ah, yes, poor pretty heart, I had forgotten him. "'Let us go back to the little creature at once.' "'I climbed the stairs of the inn and went to the room. "'The fire was not out, but there were no flames. "'I lit a candle quickly. "'I was surprised not to hear any sound from Pretty Heart. "'I found him, lying under his coverlets, "'stretched at full length, dressed in his general's uniform. "'He appeared to be asleep. "'I leaned over him and took his hand gently to wake him up. His hand was cold. Vitalis came into the room. I turned to him. Pretty heart is cold, I said. My master came to my side and also leaned over the bed. He is dead, he said. It was to be. Ah, Remy, boy, I did wrong to take you away from Mrs. Milligan. I am punished. Zerbino, Dulce. And now pretty heart, and this is not the end. End of chapter 14